Morning Lake Michigan Christian Center, I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word this morning that's going to help us kind of hit the new year running. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Reach out to friends, family members, everyone you know. Send them a link to the service. Let's get as many people as possible watching our online services on a week-to-week -week basis. All right, I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. Take care. Lake Michigan Christian Center. Happy New Year. And I've got a great word for you, but before we get to that, can we open up in a word of prayer? Father God, I thank you so much for this, uh, this new year. It's a new opportunity to serve you. And Father God, I pray for every single one of us, Father, for new vision, for new direction from the Lord. Father God, I pray that, Lord, you would just continue to prompt us and to provoke us, Lord, to serve you in an ever-increasing measure. And Father God, I pray that as we look at uh, taking spiritual inventory of our lives, Father God, I pray that you would quicken your word to all of our hearts and challenge us today. And Father, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I encourage you, if you got your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to 3 John and verse 2. 3 John only has well, one chapter, if you will. But verse two is a fairly familiar one to many of us, but it says this, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may, be, that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And, uh, you know, as we're setting the stage for a brand new year, 2022, uh, I think it's important for us to remember, you know, that, that God wants to bless us. And God wants to prosper us, and God wants to take care of us. And, and again, God is not, God is not um, uh, cordoned off or limited by time like we are. But we celebrate New Year's, and we obviously, uh, you know, chronological time is important to all of us. And, and as there is a new year, uh, I think there's new opportunities for us to learn and grow and, 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 and to allow God to do a work in our lives. And so this morning, I want to talk about taking spiritual inventory in our lives. Now, it's interesting here in 3 John 2, it talks about that he, he prays, uh, the Apostle John prays that, that the people of God would prosper in the same way or in sync with how their soul is prospering. So, so there's a link between soul prosperity, our mind, our will, our emotions being yielded to the Lord and surrendered to Him, and prosperity, whether that is physical or mental or emotional. And again, we cannot read 3 John 2 from the vantage point of Western style free market capitalism. We cannot impose upon this uh, any of that because again, that was foreign to what the Apostle John, you know, th that was foreign to his context. Um, but, but what he is talking about is something that's very, very important and that is as our mind, our will, and our emotions are in alignment with the Lord and submitted to the Lord and committed to Him is the degree to which we'll prosper in a lot of areas of our lives. And so I want to talk about that. Uh, and again, I'm just going to begin to talk about it. I've got a several week series on that. And yes, we'll get back to the book of Romans. I know we've been in that. We took a break over Christmas time. And, and again, I feel to, um, to share this for the next couple of weeks. And we'll get, we'll get back to it later on in, in uh, January or February. But uh, I want to talk about this idea of taking spiritual inventory. Now, there's a show on um, the Style Channel called Clean House. And I don't know if you've heard about it, um, but basically it's, the, it's, it's a show that deals with people who live in houses that are not ideal. You know, there's a lot of clutter. There's, there's a mess here, there's a mess there. Some people, quite frankly, are hoarders. Uh, they got stuff, you know, all over the place. And so the idea of the show is that a group of experts come in and take inventory of all that is in the house and they kind of separate it into stuff that, that, that needs to be kept 
and stuff that needs to be thrown away or gotten, you know, to, to get rid of it. And so they, they take the items that are extraneous, that are superfluous, that do not contribute or add value, and they try to sell it in a rummage sale and then earn enough money in that rummage sale to in turn remodel the house, revamp the house, repaint. And basically, again, the end game of the show in, in, in this homeowner or husband and wife submitting their home to a group of experts is that they're going to have a beautiful home, a renovated home as a result of that. And, and that is not unlike what I believe a new year um, offers us as Christians is that our house, our home, right? It, it says this in, in uh, what is it, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, right? Our home, <laughs> you know, where the Spirit of God resides is referred to as an earthen vessel. And, and, and God, as the expert, wants to renovate this body, wants to renovate our souls, our mind, our will, and our emotions, wants to renovate them for the kingdom, for kingdom rule and purposes. And we need to yield to the Lord and allow him to do a work in our lives. And so I'm going to be talking about this over the next couple of weeks about taking spiritual inventory of our spiritual growth, taking spiritual inventory of our calling. It says this in 2 Peter. It talks about making our calling and election sure. And then finally, taking inventory of how well we, as the people of God at Lake Michigan Christian Center, have embraced the vision that is set before us. But again, we're gonna focus more on, again, a very practical area of our lives, and that is taking inventory of our spiritual growth. And another scripture that talks about this is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse one. It says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. So the writer of Hebrews is talking about this idea that there's a race that every single one of us are called to as Christians, but there is an extra weight or burden that we carry or sin in our lives that keeps us from running at full tilt the race that God has set before us. And that's a great example of taking inventory. Again, as someone who runs, right? I put in 28 miles last week. I've got about 14, 14 and a half miles in this week. And as I'm recording this, this is the middle of the week. I'm hopefully gonna get, you know, another 14, 15 miles in. But one of my problems right now is that while I've been running and my running's been great, I've also been eating a lot. And, I, and you know, there's two ways you can run, right? You can, you can eat to run or you can run so you can eat. Well, guess which one I've been doing, right? Is that pork rinds been running so I can eat. Hey, no big deal, I ran 28 miles this week. I guess I can eat some extra food, right? Not cool, not good, right? Pork rind has gotta back down. <laughs> I've gotta lay aside the weight so I can run in the natural much better. But again, obviously the writer of Hebrews is talking about spiritually, what are the burdens in our lives? What, what is unnecessary weight and burden and worry and anxiety and things that can trip us up? We need to lay those things aside so we can again run the race that God has called us to run. So this idea of taking inventory of our spiritual growth, when we're talking about spiritual growth, We've got to remember that God calls us to grow. He wants us to grow. Uh, I, I'm, I'm mindful of um, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he talks about, hey, uh, you know, Paul, uh, Apollos watered, and, and, and or Paul watered, and Apollos uh, watered, but, but God gave the increase. And so what we've got to realize is that, well, it says this in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 7, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but God who makes things grow. So when we're talking about growing spiritually, we've got to realize that God is more keenly interested in our spiritual growth than we are. And I don't know if you've been, you, you've been like me, but there are times when I struggle in spiritual growth. I, I'm like, God, am I making any progress? How are we doing, God? How is my spiritual life and, and am I growing? Am I more like Jesus today than I was yesterday or a month ago or a year ago? But what we, what we need to rest in 
is that God is keenly interested in our spiritual growth. And as we yield to him, as we surrender to him, you know, as we read our Bibles, as we pray, as we do the things we know we need to do, faithful to the local church, things of that nature, ministry, God is working within us to will and to do his good pleasure. And again, he's bringing growth in our lives. So let's talk about the process of spiritual growth. What, what, what is required for us to grow? Uh, at least from a biblical perspective, which is of course where we wanna go. And, and the first is, is this idea of sanctification, being set apart as unto the Lord. Again, if I take um, a, a water bottle, right? I'm very thankful that the water in this, wa this water bottle has been set apart, right? It's been kept free from <laughs> pesticides and um, extra saliva and um, germs and whatever it is, right? <laughs> that when you buy, you know, a bottle of water at, at a store, is your, you know, your, 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 the assumption <laughs> for the consumer is that what you're buying has been set apart from contamination, so that when you drink the water you're drinking a purified you know glass of water that's the idea of being set apart of 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 being sanctified is that we and again uh, you know a lot of christians chafe at holiness a, a lot of christians think well holiness is equivalent to boredom or it's equivalent to uh preventing me from having any fun and and it cramps my style and all that kind of stuff but they miss it is that god wants to use us god wants to use our talents our abilities our resources our voice our words uh, all the things we are for his glory we god wants us to be vessels of honor that he can pour through and minister to other people. But if our lives are not clean, if our lives are impure, if we have not set ourselves apart from that which is wicked, right, that can come out in our lives as we talk to other people or minister to other people. I, I'm reminded of uh, what, what Isaiah says. It says, be clean, ye who bear the vessels of of the Lord, and he's talking about those on, in the worship ministry. Is that if you're bearing the vessels of the Lord, think of the Ark of the Covenant, think of the tabernacle, and all those types of, of pieces of the furniture, is the, the Levitical priesthood and those connected with worship were to live clean lives so that as they bore the vessels, they are a clean vessel that is being poured out upon the people as a minister before the Lord. That's this idea that we grow spiritually when our lives are set up part as unto him. And I, if you look at Romans 6 verse 19, it says, I, I use, I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer parts of your body as, uh, in slavery to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, which leads to holiness. And again, we, we must not over spiritualize what Paul's talking about. He's talking about literally all the parts of our bodies. Think of all the parts of our bodies. He's saying those need to be yielded to the Lord. And, and I, I gave this example, I don't know, a month and a half ago or so, is, is again, this idea of just take, take the idea of tennis, right? And whether you're serving or a backhand or a forehand, if you've ever played tennis, most likely, if you're like me, you've got tennis flesh, right? Paul talks about this in Romans 6, about, you know, you know getting rid of the works of the flesh in our lives, you know, to, to take the tennis example, it means it messes up your serve. Your serve is going out of bounds all the time, or you do a backhand and you're hitting it in the net, or you're knocking it out of the, you know, out of the court or something like that. In other words, there's a problem with your serve. There's a problem with your backhand. Well, how do you fix it? Well, you submit your body, you submit yourself to an expert tennis instructor that's going to show you how to serve better, so to show you how to have a better backhand to get rid of your tennis flesh. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. Because again, many times we over-spiritualize that, but he's talking about literally the parts of our body. Again, great example, our eyes, what we look at. Can that mess us up? Sure. If you got a lust problem, absolutely. How about our words? How about our tongue? Obviously, that can mess us up. What it says in James chapter 3, that the tongue is a fire, right? This is the things we've said have set on fire, um, you know, 
conversations, relationships have messed things up. And so, so when he talks about, hey, yielding your members as instruments of righteousness, literally taking every part of your body and saying, God, I give that part of me to you. God, keep me from doing anything, looking at anything I shouldn't look at, listening to something I shouldn't listen to, speaking something I shouldn't speak, whatever. Literally yielding that to the Lord as an instrument of righteousness to Him. And I've, I've told you this before, I've done this in my own life and I'll probably do it again. I've literally laid on the floor, my hands, feet, legs, all, all of my body. I said, God, I give you every part of my body. And I recounted every part of my body and I gave it to the Lord. And I said, God, I want that to be an instrument of righteousness before you. S intentionally setting ourselves apart. Now, again, I want to say this very clearly because some of you might hear this and say, well, are you advocating works righteousness, Pastor Eric? And the answer is no, of course not. What does Paul say in, in uh, Philippians 2, uh, 12 and 13? It talks about the fact that, you know, um, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's your part, your effort. For it is God that works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So it's the combination of our part. And as we do our part, the Lord works in us as well. It's an interrelationship that's taking place there. That's what we're talking about, about sanctification. That's how we grow. Second of all, uh, transformation. Like, right? If you look at uh, Romans 12, 2. A uh, very familiar scripture. It says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Obviously, that means reading your Bibles. Obviously, that means memorizing scripture. In other words, you want to take your Bible study to a whole nother level, memorize a particular scripture that spoke to you that morning. Because again, many times we'll read a, we'll read a passage of scripture, we'll have our devotional life, whatever it is, and if you ask me two hours later, hey, what did you read and tell me all about it? Sometimes, I, I'll be honest with you, it's a little fuzzy. But if I've memorized a scripture, it's there with me all the time. And again, it begins to saturate my mind with truth. That is a great way to renew your mind. It's the difference between taking a tea bag in, in, in some boiling water, dipping it in once, just like your quiet time reading your Bible, versus, hey, you, put, you keep that tea bag in the water and you keep you know, al allowing the, the, the flavor of that tea to saturate that boiling water in that cup. That is very akin to memorizing scriptures. It begins to saturate your life in a way that just mere Bible reading does not do. That's a great way to renew your mind, right? And, and what does that look like? What does a renewed mind look like? A great example of that is take a look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, right? In that section of scripture, Paul is talking about, um, again, the ungodly world <laughs> and people that don't serve God whose minds are unregenerate, whose minds reject the way of God, right? In other words, when we will know that our mind is being renewed, we know when our thinking is being transformed, when God begins to work in us to reverse what's taking place in Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32. Again, I don't have time to go through all of this, but let's just take a look at it. Look at Romans 1, 18. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their own wickedness. So we know our minds are being renewed when we stop suppressing the truth. We allow God's word to speak to us. If our lifestyle is contrary to God's word, we allow God's word to speak to us. We allow God's word to convict us. We allow God's word to begin to change us and transform. We submit to it. We, obey, we repent of disobedience and we say, God, help me to, al I'm going to align myself with what your word says. In other words, instead of suppressing the truth in your own wickedness or unrighteousness, you allow the truth to speak. You allow the truth to convict. You allow the truth to begin to change your Life. And again, I could go on and on and on, but that's, that, that's, that's when we know that our minds are being transformed, that we don't twist the scriptures <laughs> to make it fit with our lifestyle and our preferences and our feelings, but we allow our feelings and our preferences and our moods and our inclinations and our appetites to subordinate 
to God's will and rule and authority in his word. That's what transformation is. And again, we need to have that posture in our hearts that we are humble enough to say, God, be God. Let your word be true. Let God be true. And let every man be a liar. God, you are right. You are true. And I submit myself to you. And another way that we're transformed is what 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says, where it talks about that, that, that we are transformed as we behold the glory of the Lord. Immersing ourselves in God's presence also begins to break our hearts and our minds and, and even our wills. We, we suddenly become pliable and, and humble. And we say, God, not my will be done, but thy will be done. That's this process of a transformation of our thinking. And then finally, it's maturity, okay? So the three components or the pathway of spiritual growth is sanctification, being set apart for God's use, uh, being transformed by the renewing of our minds, and then maturity, okay? Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. The writer says this, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. Let's stop right there. He's saying, listen, there are, there are Christians that have been in the church for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Okay? They are consumers, not contributors to the local church. They come, they consume, they receive, they never give, they never serve. In fact, he says, listen, you all ought to be teachers. And I, I, I've shared this before, but there's no compelling reason why the vast majority of those of you that attend Lake Michigan Christian Center, there's no compelling reason why you shouldn't be a small group leader. There's no compelling reason why. Uh, you, you can go to many church plants and places where God is moving in, in areas of the world and it's not unusual for people to start leading groups within a month or two or three or even less of, of, of getting saved. Okay, and then what does that say of us? I've been saved for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is, and you're not serving in that particular capacity. Okay, in other words, that's what he's talking about, about maturity. Part of maturity is stepping up and assuming responsibility. Or as I've said before, maturity doesn't come with age. Maturity comes with the, the acceptance of responsibility. Okay, moving on here. He says, listen, you need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, this idea of constant use refers to a state or a condition. Okay, he's talking about, again, the context of, of Hebrews here is Hebrews 5. Well, the whole book is a church that is under persecution for their faith. And so he talks about the fact that you know you, be, you are becoming mature as a Christian is that you face persecution head on. You stand for truth head on. You speak the truth and not lies head on. Even if culture is going in a totally different direction, you're going to say, you know what? This is what God says about this particular issue. This is the truth and I don't care the consequences. I'm standing for God. It's a state where, again, it's a state or a condition of maturity where, hey, I don't care. I'm not going to flinch. I'm going God's way. Even if no one is following me, it doesn't matter. I'm doing what God is telling me to do from his word. And again, maturity. As a Christian, moving from pampers right, to adult clothing. Uh, as a Christian, moving from milk to solid food. As a Christian, moving from a consumer mindset as a Christian to a contributor mindset. I want to teach. I want to lead. I want to get involved. I want to serve. I want to roll up my sleeves and begin to help in this local church ministry in some capacity. That's a mark of maturity. Again, parents, you know what it means. You know your kids finally become mature when they stop asking you for money and they might give you some money or pay for a vacation for you or something like that, right? You know your kids are maturing when they're able to live out of the house, you move out of the house and get a job and take care of themselves and not keep asking for funds, right? It's that same parallel in the spiritual realm. And this is what the writer was saying. Listen, you guys ought to be teachers right now. Come on, step it up. You can do this, okay? So this is this, again, we're taking inventory, right? We're, we're, we're looking at our lives, and again, this is a great time for that. Many companies in the time frame between Christmas and New Year's, right? They, they shut down and they take inventory. They see where they're at 
so they can take on the new year with greater momentum. And that's what we're doing here in this mini series here about taking inventory, challenging about our sanctification, about our transformation, being transformed by the renewing of our minds, and then our maturity, taking a litmus test of, hey, listen, <laughs> 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, how, how much are you contributing within the local church? God using you and your talents and your resources for God. So again, I encourage you, take inventory of your spiritual lives. And we're going to continue this series over the next several weeks. I think it's going to be great. So I hope that you will be encouraged and challenged by it. Can we pray? Father, I thank you so much for your word. Father God, your word is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And my prayer is for every single one of us, and begin with me. God, help us to take inventory of our sanctification. Help us to take inventory of the renewal of our mind. Help us to take inventory of our maturity level. Where are we at, Father, in relation to our knowledge of you, our walk with you, and all that we've been given? Father God, are we contributing and adding value, or are we merely consuming and merely receiving? Father, I ask you would challenge every single one of us, Father God, so that, God, we could have a great, great 2022. And Father God, I pray your blessing over every single person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, it was great to be with you. I call you blessed. Until next week, take care.